Atlantic Terminus, Southampton Docks. Queen Mary, greatest of ocean-going liners, lies in the huge King George V graving dock for inspection and overhaul. But now leave and forget these man-made modern scenes. Come northwards up Southampton Water and explore the treasures of the Valley of the Test, where so much of the present is still the past. Here at the tidal river mouth is a new concrete road bridge, revealing its charming old world predecessor, resting now in honoured retirement. They are the boundaries of the active industry we have left, and the pastoral peace of the valley beyond. Through the rich water meadows of this valley, the river Test flows along its reed-lined bed from the chalk hills of northern Hampshire, serenely to the sea. Its crystal waters are renowned for the splendid salmon and trout they hold. The biggest fish are, of course, caught by untiring and dauntless fishermen who claim that the sport offered here has no equal in the south of England. No words of theirs can describe its excellence, no arms the size of their catches. The river, too, has worked for man, grinding and crushing his corn. The harvests of many centuries have passed between the stones of these mills built across the stream. wheels are turning now and the endless power of the river remains unemployed like the men who made use of it. Thatched cottages and barns cluster thickly in every village of the valley. They absorb and reflect the calm peace of their neighbour the river. For 800 years, the red brick town of Romsey has lain close around its great Norman Abbey, while water has flowed and mill races bubbled through its streets and beneath its houses, turning its wheels, brewing its beer, doing its work rain or fine, year in and year out with timeless energy. Romsey Abbey is one of the finest examples of Norman building in this country. The exterior, rugged and severe, is grandly proportioned. The east end is rectangular and not apsidal or semicircular in form, as was usual for this period. The square squat tower is typical of Norman work. Largely because part of the abbey was being used as their parish church, the people of Romsey were graciously allowed by Henry VIII to purchase the entire building for the sum of £100, at a time when that monarch was disposing of church property for cash, and as we shall see later, leased the nearby abbey at Mottisfont to a personal friend as a private house. These marks were made by bullets fired by the soldiers of that father of dictators, Oliver Cromwell. From the west end of the nave, this fine example of Norman architecture is clearly seen. Excepting the east windows and the roof, much of the original masonry remains unspoiled by later reconstruction or the so-called restorers of the 19th century. The arches of the south aisle are more than half a circle in shape, possibly due to distortion of the outer walls by weight. They have an oriental appearance and may perhaps be evidence of Saracen influence on Norman style. On three slabs of stone set in the outside wall of the south transept is carved a magnificent crucifix, thought to be the finest of early Norman origin in the land. The conception here is of the living Christ, the conqueror of death. The hand of glory is outstretched from the clouds. The head is erect, the hands and feet are not nailed. The sculptor has shown Christ's joy in the realization of his sacrifice. Below the shapely vaulted roof at the head of the south aisle is the chapel of St. Anne, where a simple altar stands in quiet dignity beneath a window. Over the altar is another crucifix of early Saxon origin, the oldest in England. Figures of angels upon the arms of the cross swing censers. Below appear Our Lady and St. John. At the foot, two Roman soldiers with spear and sponge. The true vine branches from the stem of the cross. In 993, the early church was destroyed by the Danes. Rebuilt seven years later in stone, its foundations still exist within the present building. Abbesses of the conventual church of Saints Mary and Ethelfrieda Romsey, AD 907, St. Ethelfrieda, 1st Abbess. Alicia de Wintershall, poisoned, 1314. The church was purchased from the king by the parishioners to use as their parish church for 100 pounds in the year 1543. On this capital is a wonderfully preserved carving from life of King Stephen and Queen Matilda, date about 1145. In this one, angels restrain two kings who have met in battle and are about to fight a duel. This 
chevron work is a beautiful characteristic of Norman style. The south transept contains the children's chapel, a bright and inviting corner for boys and girls to worship in as they please and to keep fragrant with the flowers they bring. St. Lawrence at the head of the North Isle has a considerable bearing upon the history of the Abbey. This is the part which the townspeople of Romsey bought from that royal plunderer King Henry VIII for the sum of a hundred pounds. Here is the original deed of conveyance dated 1543 with the great seal of England appended and signed by Henry VIII himself. The loop of the H forms the E. The N placed on the left hand side. The R with the second vertical stroke completing the H and the Y. Out once more into the hot and languid summer noon, let us pass on from the unchanging Abbey of Romsey up the valley to another Abbey which has a very different story. Let us in passing experience the loveliness of this river's every mood from early dawn to dusk. up the test above Romsey is the quiet village of Mottisfont. A few farms, a few cottages, a forge, one shop and a church. This also was built in the early Norman days and age has defaced the names from the oldest gravestones. When Cromwell's cannons bombarded the village, the east window was hidden in the river and is today the oldest known complete window of its kind. Here is the one and only village store, which has one of everything for sale. Beside it, under the same spreading chestnut tree, stands the village smithy with its forge, where everything in iron, from toasting forks to cartwheel tires, are beaten out. Meet the blacksmith, fashioning footwear of many styles for his horsey customers, who still prefer handmade shoes. On spacious lawns by the water, Mottisfont Abbey stands in quiet seclusion. On the site of this great and beautiful house, there was built in the late 12th and early 13th centuries an abbey, founded by William Brewer as the house of a brotherhood of Austin Friars. The Oakley stream branching from the test a mile above this point flowed through the grounds. Doubtless its course was determined when the abbey was being erected. 
After the dissolution, Henry VIII generously presented the abbey to his chamberlain, Lord Sands, but at the same time charged him 51 pounds rent per annum. Little remains of the reconstructions of that period. The house we see today was completed in the early 18th century by Sir Richard Mill, a descendant of Lord Sands. This entrance, facing the stream in the east, clearly shows the ecclesiastical origins of the house. Round at the north front, we seem to be looking at a church. No brick, only flint and stone are used in this face, but its sterner appearance is relieved by these thick-set box tree clumps. On the gates are the arms of the mill family, two bears carved in stone. These are the fine Georgian stables. The abbey stands on a luscious carpet of grass, sloping to the clear water, overhung by well-grown trees. Of these, the greatest are the plains. This one is a monarch indeed. It measures over 36 feet round the waist. Its hanging branches forever trail in the stream, where long green reeds wave in the water and trout abound. In such a setting, Mottis Font, with its long history and strange medley of styles, must make a sympathetic home indeed. From the brightness of the gardens, we can enter this cool, dark crypt below the west wing of the house. A fine vaulted roof of stone, reposing on fat round columns all splendidly preserved, make this the most complete remnant of the Middle Ages in the building. Between the kitchen and the scullery, there is a four-centered stone pulpit of arch with tracery soffit. The four shields on each side bear the coats of arms of benefactors of the abbey, from Bruyer, its founder, to Hutoft, mayor of Southampton. The latter, who gave this pulpitum and many other gifts, hoped through his generosity to become the owner of the abbey. Note the astonishing thickness of the walls in this scene. Other notable remains are this piscina and some of the original arcading of the nave, dating from about 1200 AD. The most convincing proof of the success of the reconstruction is seen in these living rooms where the work and imagination of their occupants from the 16th to the 20th centuries have brought new life to a fine edifice once doomed to ruin and desolation. This handsome dining room is painted white, the beveled edges of its panels and pedimented door frames picked out in gilt. The lovely gallery of the Sir Richard Mill period is little altered and its dignified proportions need few ornaments. Another room on the north side of the house, entered by passing through the thick wall containing the structure of the old chapel, is this white bedroom. The deeply set windows in the solid north wall give a restrained and pleasing light, admirably framed by the long, heavy, white hanging. The curtain rod and the top of the four-post bed is loosely draped in gold and white satin. This room formed a part of the nave of the chapel. A piece of the original stonework is revealed here. An 18th century basket vase in gilded porcelain. The present day is represented by this fine drawing, the work of Pablo Picasso, greatest of living painters. This bedroom is one of the south rooms, all of which were added by Sir Richard Mill in the 18th century. Its proportions are in marked contrast to the rooms in the monastic part of the house. Through an open window, summer freshness calls us outside once more. This is the wonderful font, Mottis Funda, which attracted settlers throughout the ages and from which Mottis Font derives its name. From blue mysterious depths, strange plants sway gently to the surface as the spring presses past them, welling ever upwards from the dark places of the earth on its endless course to the sea. This font, this constant source of life, has watched the past and will witness the future. What changes shall it see?